At the end of my second week living in Kowalski's house, you know, hiding in his attic, I decided I needed a healthier attitude. While I was there, lying with nothing to do, forced to remain silent, I collected the elements of my future life piece by piece. And then I tried to solve the puzzle. Psychologists probably have a name for what I was doing. You would probably just call it getting your life together. Well, a plan to get my life together. Even if it was more like daydreaming about getting a tent and camping in the woods, getting a car to pretend I was living a normal life, nobody would have to know I was homeless. I could even get a job, minimum wage, doesn't matter. Get back on my feet, save something, get away. Thousands of miles away. Shake the shame. Get a tiny studio apartment, a fridge, food, food until I'm stuffed, taking a bath whenever I want to, making as much noise as I want to make for as long as I want to make it until not even I can stand it. Life, I think they call that. Still, as bright as those thoughts were, they got old fast, fast as anything I can think of did. So, I had to find a way to entertain myself during those few hours I was able to leave the attic. Funny, I felt like a kid in so many ways, hiding from an adult, going places I wasn't supposed to, doing things that scared me, fearing a ghost. Yes, at that point, the sounds in the house were named Ghost, with a capital G. It was a name, not a noun. And yes, I was afraid of going to the bathroom, of leaving the attic at all. But that was the case even before Ghost showed up. The thought of getting caught was terrifying. Jail didn't bother me, not really. Actually, it would have been an improvement. It was the thought of Kowalski throwing me back on the streets to fight for my life in the cruel, merciless urban ecosystem that made me cry, as I used to cry when I was ten and my brother took all the ice cream for himself. So I decided I should be a brave girl, conquer my fears, all over again. And after taking my shower and cleaning everything up barefoot, I explored the house. I took a knife with me, just in case Ghost decided to pay a visit while I was exploring. To be honest, I only had a real idea of what the upper floor and the kitchen were like. I never explored beyond that. The bare glimpses I had of the house before were not enough anymore. I started on familiar soil with the second floor, revisiting everything I had already seen and finding small new details that I missed the first time. There was a room with a small, child-sized bed and no other furniture. There was an empty room with a pair of paintings on the walls, nothing I could recognize. Not that I know a lot about art, or anything for that matter, but it seemed very amateurish to my eye. There was no paint lying around, no brushes. I assumed that Kowalski used to paint. And then I found this other room. I don't even know what to call it. Dumpster might be the right word. There was an old fan, a bunch of closed boxes, a table, shelves, books in Polish and English, a paleolithic computer, everything just gathered, put there with no order, thrown in and forgotten, I guess. No, I didn't belong there. The first floor was very much like the second. There was another bathroom and the kitchen, as I have said. A tidy master bedroom and what I thought was a guest bedroom. A library full of books about philosophy and physics and history and 
probably not one single non-fiction novel, not that I tried to find one. And then there was the living room, a big couch, a carpet, a coffee table, you know, a big television mounted to the wall, massive. The place itself was big and expensive. I wondered why a man who lived alone would want such a place. And then I wondered what Kowalski did for a living. I'd overheard him on the phone several times, but never gotten any clues about what his work actually involved. And then there was the basement. I opened the door and, using the light that bled over my back from the room behind me, I tried to find a switch for the basement's lights. I didn't find it, so I went down, slowly, fearing the possibility of falling, breaking one of my bones, and not being able to retreat to the attic, of being found, oh god, <laughs> being found. As I took that first step, descending, the darkness below seemed to devour me. That was... it was good. That was good. The shadows were old friends at this point. I felt safer being tucked behind its black mantle. And then, once I reached the floor, still with one hand on the wall to guide me, I found the switch. And then, as they say, there was light. The light bulb burned with its yellow, phantasmagoric glow. My eyes adjusted, and I will need a lifetime to recover. I was in front of some kind of altar. There was a circle painted with a dark stain of some kind. In the center, a pedestal, and on the pedestal, something white. Pushed by curiosity and nothing more, I stepped forward. The white thing was a sculpture of a snake made from bones. Vertebrae formed the body, and many small finger bones, phalanges, formed its head. And the tongue, I swear, the tongue was moving. And as I was there, standing still, I heard it. Footsteps. I ran. I ran. Like an idiot 15-year-old, I ran upstairs, back to the attic, heedless of who might hear me, instead of outside. I stayed in the dark, trembling, listening, and for a moment I was able to locate the exact place where those footsteps were coming from, behind me. But it was just for a moment. A minute or two later, I could hear it on the floor below me. Again. Again. For another story, tune in next Tuesday. Meanwhile, watch another video. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Check the description for our social media, and sleep well, if you can. Ha 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 ha!